Welcome to a special takeover edition of the Inner Loop Radio. I'm Michael Collier, and I'll be your host today. The title of my takeover is No Exercises, No Writing for Exercise. Okay, but what about a three goat story? The Breadloaf Writers Conference, where I taught for many years, was founded in 1926 mainly at the suggestion of Robert Frost. A letter he wrote in 1922 describes the kind of instruction a bread loaf teacher might give. The letter provides the inspiration for what follows. Here's Frost. I told them, and the them here refers to a previous conversation he'd had with Breadloaf School of English faculty members. I told them they want for teacher, a writer with writing of his own on hand, who would be willing to live for a while on terms of equality almost with the few young writers. Almost, I say. I wouldn't have him go so far as to carry his manuscript to them, as they would be free to bring theirs to him. He would expect to take as well as give in as fair exchange as possible, if not ideas of form, then ideas and observations of life. He would stay mainly at the level of the material. He would refrain from finding fault except in the large. He would turn from correcting grammar in red ink to matching experience in black ink experience of life and experience of art. He will invade them to show them how much more they contain than they can write down, to show them their subject matter is where they came from. I kept repeating, no exercises, no writing for exercise. The writer's whole nature must be in every piece he sets his hand to. And his whole nature includes his belief in the real value the writing will have when finished. It must be done once for all. It must be an achievement. Now, these are excerpts from a a longer letter, uh, but to me, they're the most most germane. And it's, it's interesting to see in some ways how prescient they are And they predict a kind of model of teaching that is pretty much still in effect. It's interesting, Frost spends so much time describing the relational distance between the established writer and the student. That phrase, on terms of equality almost. A relationship that stops at the point where the teacher would bring their work to the student for critique. Interesting, too that they would refrain from fault-finding, except in the large. And I think about this in relationship to how important the idea of craft is to contemporary creative writing. And I think Frost's idea of craft was was quite limited. Um, And the importance he puts on observing life and observing art is a little bit different than what creative writing teachers uh, do now. Interesting too, and very crucially to my mind, is how the teacher would turn from correcting grammar in red ink to matching experience in black ink, experience of life and experience of art. And what kind of lies behind this is Frost's skepticism um, and at times outright disdain at how literature was taught by professors at American universities. He felt one of the things that was missing was this experience of life and that the uh, literature professors really had no idea how writing was made. And um, he wanted, he didn't want this to necessarily go into universities or colleges. But he felt that the Breadloaf Writers Conference could follow this in what he thought of as a very American 
model. And in this way, they'll be shown how much more they contain than they can write to show them their subject matter is where they came from. But what I find most uh, interesting is Frost's emphatic, no exercises, no writing for exercise. Why is he so emphatic? Because I think the writer's whole nature, as he said, must be in every piece he sets his hand to. And his whole nature includes his belief in the real value the writing will have when finished. It must be done once for all. It must be an achievement. Because it's not a game, I think, in Frost's mind. It's not busy work. And he didn't want to shift the seriousness onto something that seemed overly playful. In my own experience as a teacher, except in poetic forms and translation courses, and except on a very few other occasions, I've avoided using exercises and prompts. And I can't think of a time I ever used, um, ever asked a class to do free writing. I guess I agree with Frost about the writer's whole nature needing to be in everything they write. And yet several years ago, I was part of a literary cultural exchange program that brought a handful of Turkish college students from Istanbul to Armenia to meet their Armenian counterparts in the country's capital, Yerevan. The day before I was to co-lead a workshop with Chris Merrill, we had been talking about various strategies we might employ. And he told me a really funny story about a fiction writer he knew who very offhandedly had come up with a workshop prompt she called a three goat story. A three goat story, very simply, requires that somewhere and somehow, and it's the only requirement, during the chorus of the story, three goats make an appearance. I loved the absurdity of the premise, and remember, I remember how much we laughed at it, thinking it ridiculous, but also really charmed by it. Because who doesn't love a goat? And how much more love would we have for three goats? And so I thought it was a good way to go for the prompt I would give to the workshop the next day. And here it is very important, I admit, that at 64 years of age, I had only done one activity of group writing, only one. And that was when I was in graduate school and the instructor who will go unnamed had us passed out blindfolds and uh, we all com uh, you know, followed his instruction to put them on and then do five minutes of free writing. I, I thought this was absurd and um, in some ways even condescending and that it trivialized uh, the art any kind of literary literary art. So I had a really bad experience with that. Also, I have to admit um, that the idea of writing uh, with a limited amount of time and in a group and then having to show it to the group made me feel very, very, very vulnerable. And I felt, well, it's, you feel vulnerable enough when you're at your desk alone trying to write. Uh, but the public vulnerability, I guess you could say it, ma it made me feel exposed and I was always uncomfortable with it. So I give the assignment 
to write everybody to write a three goat story. I can't recall what any of us came up with when we went around the table to read our drafts. But I do recall the heightened feeling of intimacy and camaraderie the, act the activity created, much more important than any single literary artifact produced. This was especially important for the Turkish and Armenian students to have this bond, this intimacy created because of the tragic history of genocide that divides them. Anyway, I'd say our goats took us a long way from Frost's prohibition against writing exercises and his single-minded and, dare I say, romantic focus on the individual artist. Frost, writing so perceptively a hundred years ago about one kind of student mentorship a writer's conference could offer, maybe wasn't able to see the power, let's say, of a community in the development of a writer and the vulnerability it requires. And in my many years of teaching, I had overlooked the possibility that a shared exercise could help to build a community. Maybe I had taken Frost's on terms of equality almost too literally. But when I returned from Armenia, I had this draft of my three goats. And because as, as I said, the, the whole premise I think is hilarious and wonderfully absurd. Nevertheless, I wanted to believe it might lead me somewhere. So I kept working on it. But also, whenever I worked on it, I felt the charming camaraderie of those students and selfishly wanted to prolong and keep inside the memory of being with them. So I'm going to end by reading the poem. It's dedicated to Chris Merrill and those students I met in Yerevan in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2017. And I'd also uh, like to invite any of you to try and write your own. If you do, why don't you send it to hello at the inner loop lit dot org. And in the subject line, put a three goat story. Here's mine. A three goat story. A goat in a fig tree is easier to see than describe. An unstable negotiation between clinging and scrabbling. A four point stance askew in an isosceles triangle. Once we got the goat out of the tree, we still had to lead it along the road. And leading it along the road was harder than coaxing it down. But getting the goat to sit in the Civic's back seat with two other goats was harder still. In fact, the problem of settling two goats was how the third got away. A goat in a tree is like an empty prophecy, a watering place without water. And three goats sitting on their haunches, shoulder strapped in a car? There is no ending, no moral, not even an improbable beginning to a three goat story. Okay, that's it for today's show. If you're interested in reading another goat poem of mine titled Goat on a Pile of Scrap Lumber, you can find it in my most recent book, The Missing Mountain, New and Selected Poems. And thanks so much for listening. <laughs>